Good morning. Uh, today we are going to have the lecture on oligopoly, assumptions and real world behavior, which is actually the continuation of what we have uh, discussed in the early lectures, especially on a market condition, uh, including we had already covered the perfect competitive environment, then monopoly, then we have seen different variations of monopoly and uh, uh, in the last lecture we discussed about monopolistic competition and uh, critical analysis. Now in that uh, row of uh, market structure, uh, the issue of oligopolistic competition is remaining and uh, today is what I am going to discuss is that. So uh, normally let's st uh, start speaking about the oligopoly market situation in a simpler sense and in a very preliminary ex uh, kind of uh, setting. So in order to start with, uh, let's have certain assumptions which in fact talks about or uh, largely deals with this particular uh, market structure. So the first one is there are few sellers and many buyers. This is the first assumptions normally the very uh, characteristics of this market uh, is being you know um, envisions uh, and the second one is firms produce and sell either homogeneous product or differentiated product. So in the perfect competition what we had strictly is a mono homogeneous product and uh, whereas in the monopolistic competition you do have actually differentiated product. So either this thing can be actually the case in this particular market structure therefore there is no restriction on the characteristics of the product per se. And the third assumption is normally seen that uh, there are significant barriers to entry. This is also quite interesting because uh, 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 you know, the monopolistic as well as uh, the perfect competitive environment which normally set the standard of all analysis, uh, it uh, talks about basically there is no such a barrier or uh, free entry and exit. So we don't use that word free entry and exit, but there is no barrier per se. So uh, unlike the monopoly where you have no, uh, no entry because it is completely restricted because of so many reasons and all. So that is also signifies the kind of uh, selling behavior like uh, an oligopoly means a few seller in that sense. So. Uh, concentration ratio is also very very important as far as the oligopoly is concerned because we know that if it is monopoly uh, very simple to understand because the concentration means a one that means a complete concentration then only you can say that it is a monopoly but if there is an uh, you know uh, moving away from uh, this sort of a concentration uh, of uh, one, then you can say that there are other firms exist and that they do have control in the market uh, output in that sense. So through that way, they also influence the, the price of the commodity in that sense. So in that in the in that setting in the in that particular understanding, it is very important to look into the concentration of uh, the industry and which will tell you that whether the firm is a powerful oligopolistic uh, firm or a very uh, insignificant kind of a firm in that sense. So when, uh, when all this is actually in place, then the most critical point of barriers to entry is in place as we have uh, already said in the, in, the, in the case that you know, there is no barriers to entry is in fact uh, being placed in the model however if in the monopolistic competition and if you have a sort of um, concentration possible concentration then it is also not that easy as I showed in the beginning I said there is no free entry you know? there are barriers there are sort of a constraint in that sense so that constraints or barriers in fact uh, try to put because of so many reasons. So the oligopolis is protected by barriers to entry. Example economies of scale and capital requirement, control of input supplies, cost the differences, 
then you have governmental regulations, product complexity, product proliferation, then you also have product recognitions, etc. So these are, uh, you know, different reasons. So these are actually, uh, you know, uh, non-market reasons. In fact, all this is, in fact, non-market reasons. Okay, uh, that is, it is not spontaneous in that sense. So if you have all this kind of uh, uh, barriers exist in the uh, market structure, then you can say that that is a kind of an oligopoly. It itself, in fact, mm, you know, uh, uh, picture that this is actually a market structure which is having this sort of a characteristics in that sense. Now, how do we uh, find the the, the uh, concentration? Uh, there are many understanding regarding that. One of that is basically the learner index mono of monopoly power. You know, as I said in the beginning, the concentration itself means monopoly. That means if you have a, a concentration of one, then technically it is a monopoly. Not only really technical, by very default it is monopoly. But if you have less than that, then you can say that the firm is no longer a monopoly in that sense. So uh, that is pretty simple. That is, you have a sort of a monopoly understanding based on a equation which is called the Lerner index monopoly equation which imply that the p minus nc by p is actually what is called the index of uh, the indicator of whether the firm is uh, a monopoly or if a monopoly then what or, or a concentrated or if that is the case then how much it has been concentrated in that sense. So monopoly power as a difference between therefore price and marginal cost expressed as the percentage of price in that sense. So, so very simple um, formulation, but it is very, very important to understand the monopoly behavior or sort of a oligopolistic understanding in that sense. So real world monopolies may have other control over markets, uh, such as ability to withhold technology, etc., but not in the particular oligopolistic setting. Now, uh, if you have all this thing, that is the classification of real world market structure in that sense, concentration ratio measures the percentage of sales, assets, outputs or employment that is controlled by the largest firm. We can call it as an X firm, which is the largest, you know, leader of this kind of, I'm not talking about the leader per se model, like, like uh, the uh, leadership model, but anyway, I'm coming to that particular uh, setting. So, for example, a, a four firm sales concentration ratio expressed the sales of four largest firm as a percentage of industrial sale. This, this can be or can be used as this uh, particular, um, you know, index to understand the level of concentration or the oligopolistic power of that particular uh, market or, or, or that particular sorry not market the the firm itself now now if you have a four firm sales concentration ratio then you call it a cr4 so for many years it was the measuring stick by with the competitiveness of an industry will measure so uh, this is what is called the four uh, firms uh, weighted average in that sense so when the ratio exceeds say 50 percent the industry is said to be concentrated that means the major four industries in fact having an output control of more than 50 percent then you can simply say that there is a high concentration there is a possibility of cartel and we had already uh, mentioned about that in the earlier lecture even the monopolistic competition this is possible so then that means there is a <coughs> oligopolic trend is perceived uh, is persisting in that particular sort of uh, situation now if you have a four uh, firm meter form uh, firms uh, index or kind of uh, you know uh, indices which will develop uh, to indicate that actually the collective uh, concentration is more than 50 percent this is not going to be giving as a clear picture in that. So, so concentration ratio of ignore two key considerations in that context. So the first one, the person, uh, the, the presence of foreign competition in that sense. So the second one, the degree to which market power is dispersed beyond for biggest firms. 
now this is these two uh, understanding or these two uh, uh, facts uh, need to be also checked while we talk about the concentration of oligopolic firm now uh, for in order to understand that normally what we do is actually to calculate uh, the concentration ratio in that sense of a herfindel hirschman index so what does hhi tells us that that is herfindel hirschman index tells us that when you have e, uh, hh equals the sum of squared market shares of each firm in the industry then that is uh, is going to tell you that you know whether there is a high concentration or not that is s1 firm and the squared market share of them plus s2 firms their squared market share etc etc sn is what is actually the herfindel hirschman index talks about when s1 through sn are the market shares of firm 1 because you may be having different uh, market under your control right for example, our next company can have a commodity not only uh, which is going to be sold or they are selling in India, but also they also find market in a number of places, right? Non-Indian uh, markets like Indian market plus, then that is actually what is called the concentration of that particular firm. It is not necessarily some X firm may be this is why because the very idea is very simple that is, x firm need not be a, a driver or a sort of a concentrated in one place if together if you calculate their marketability then we can say that whether the firm is in fact concentrated or a monopoly kind of a uh, firm because that is uh, also makes sense in that sense very very important point why because of uh, many uh, logical issue, uh, logical, you know, uh, possibilities. That is, uh, you know, uh, I maybe have a big firm. I have uh, throughout the world network. So maybe I am having twenty percent of say, share in India, and another fifteen percent of share in China. Then you have actually another 10, 20 percent of uh, in United States or in Britain or European market or, or Latin America or etc. Together, you know. I may control a major share in the international market in that sense. If you consolidate all the domestic market together, then I may be a concentrated firm. Otherwise, may not be it is going to give you a clear picture because if uh, China become uh, suppose if China is one of the largest market in the world, 15% of Chinese market concentration is huge. Same the case with India is a big market in that sense. If you have 10% or 15% here, then together of this entire world market of that particular commodity or uh, produce is going to have huge. And if you have 10% in the United States and all kinds of this market, and then in fact, you are quite a big firm in an international sense with the total uh, you know, uh, output selling that sense so you may be having uh, you are maybe ha maybe a driver in that sense or a monopoly kind of you know for uh, in that sense you know to understand the monopoly your hh is actually the squared percentage or then it is being calculated in ten thousands in that sense so how much is your market share in that sense now the justice department considered if you have a Herfindel Hirschman index is less than 1000 competitive, 10% at 10% level in that sense. Or oh, if it is greater than 10,000, say, you know, uh, 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 then you are concentrated in that sense. So, a uh, merger in a previous concentrated industry that raises the HHI value by less than 100 under Clinton or 200 under Reagan and push points is level in that sense. So this is also uh, understandable in international sense. So this is what is actually something to do with the characteristics of the oligopolistic model um, uh, in, the, in, the, on, in the outset. We will come to different oligopolistic model uh, now because that is very very important. Now there are uh, market structure which talks about or inspired by the work of Paul and Suisi 
uh, American economists and a very renowned economist, in fact. So, uh, Paul, this is actually in the onset of uh, the debate which was happened in 1930s in Britain as well as in the United States because uh, we all know that there is a great uh, shift, uh, uh, especially on the discussion of uh, cost and uh, the characteristics of firm which it took, uh, took up or which had happened in 1930s. We know that there are, uh, you know, magnificent or what you call the seminal works like um, uh, Ronald Coe's uh, The Nature of Firm, uh, or you say uh, 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 Suisse's work uh, on the market uh, characteristics, especially uh, the demand uh, response, etc are very, very important. Or you say that uh, the, the, the interpersonal utility analysis debate in which had happened in the economic journal under Keynes uh, and Harold, then uh, Robbins, etc. We have a great, in, great uh, sort of uh, papers like uh, Calder Hicks, uh, or you can have nice paper which is written by Samuels and et all, in fact during this particular period. This is a nice uh, period, in fact, and there is a lot of discussion to go. Uh, and in that, one of the most important thing is actually about the behavior of the demand curve, uh, largely known as the King to Demand Curve Theory or proposition by uh, Polem Suvesi. So let's look into the details of that. And we will be having a series of discussion on oligopoly by others who preceded uh, the very understanding of uh, uh, Pollum Suisi also, and of course later economists who also try to see uh, other possibilities. So let's look into uh, the understanding of King de Demanker theory. So assume that the oligopolist believe that its rival will basically match any price cut uh, it initiates, but ignore any price increase it initiates in that sense. So it's very interesting observation. So the Bauer assumption on how rival firms react implies that you, the demand of a firm has a king at the present prevailing price. That means, of course, being uh, you all in the competitive environment, be, you means the, the, the firms in, in the market always looks each other and how they behave and respond. Uh, each other is, is very important. You cannot simply ignore this fact. So once, uh, mostly what happened is that once you cut the price, okay, then immediately your rival firm copes. But uh, then you won't in fact get a, a kind of, you know, advantage in that sense. But at the same time, once you increase the price, not necessarily all the firm is going to basically follow that sort of an increase because of so many, very many reasons in that sense. So immediately the, the demand from your firms to their firm increases in that sense. So there is all possibilities exist in the real world. But at the same time, there is also quite normally the opposite also will take place. Therefore, what the, the, the whole analysis try to say is that there is a possibility of rigidity uh, in the demand or there is a possible kink happens. You know, one, uh, it is not what is actually this rigidity or smoothness try to say is very simple that if you say smoothness, that means everybody behaves some in the same direction. So, uh, an increase in price will lead to, you know, an increase in the other firms also, but this is not happening in that sense. So this gap implies that there is an MC can shift somewhat without causing the firms to change its price or output in that sense. So this is a very important uh, observation in that sense. And in fact, it's real kind of an observation, uh, just like what uh, Ronald Coase was talked about, like what would be the characteristics of a firm uh, under a market setup. All right. So whether the market is going to be really 
Now, whether the firm is going to be really as equal as market functions, oh, this is a very critical point, in fact, and uh, this is uh, crucial because this question remains still date a debatable question in that sense. Once you agree that, then there is a whole lot of different uh, discussion uh, uh, derives uh, from the very, you know, what you call classically the mainstream economics, or you call new classical economics, whatever. Okay, so uh, the price, uh, the prediction of the model is the following under the King Demand Curve function, uh, uh, you know, framework. That is where you predict our price rigidity, price changes will not necessarily follow from change in marginal cost. Now, that is actually the kind of situation which we have seen earlier. That is whatever price changes which is going to be followed from the marginal cost. But this is nothing to do with that. That is what is the whole argument. On price competition, firm will completely, co sorry, a firm will compete uh, through advertising and or product differentiation in that sense. So, firm will avoid competing by reducing price in that sense. So, this is also very important. Why we have already seen that Edward Chamberlain's proposition said there is always a product differentiation which makes, which fends around. Uh, a certain consumer, whether their product and that, and because of the product differentiation, you are able to advertise. And of course, we have already seen what Galbraith said. You know, you try to make people uh, uh, under your own, uh, you know, need to uh, what you call fence within the fence, and then you make them consume your product in that sense. So it is difficult. This is a kind. This is a kind of a non-market. Uh, mechanism in that sense of a spontaneity perspective. Now, if that is the case, then what would be the uh, simple uh, form of your, um, you know, market demand curve looks like? This is what is actually shown in this graph. So, once you have this K uh, portion and you can have another D portion, so this is what is called your entire demand. So now you have a marginal revenue corresponding to that and uh, of course there is a possibility of an um, uh, elastic as well as an inelastic market demand in that sense. It's only a relative uh, elastic and inelastic between the different marginal revenues which in fact you acquire or you, you realize in the market, real market which is actually uh, also depends on the different uh, response which you in fact had in the uh, uh, market especially in the demand uh, in the market so the key behavioral assumption is that if the firm if a firm single firm lowers price other firm will do likewise but if a single firm rise price other firm will not follow that means there is no smooth moving of price change character uh, strategy okay that is if you have price change strategies take place then that price change ta uh, strategy uh, may follow only one direction not in all two directions in that sense so if that is the case then immediately there is going to be a king in your the respective demand curves okay so that will create a kind of gap or what do you call the elastic inelastic problem and then you have a sort of marginal cost which lies in between, no, nobody knows in that sense. So there is a fuzziness in that sense about the marginal cost which equates with the marginal revenue. You, you know that somewhere we are there but not exactly where we are. With the earlier graph you can simply demonstrate that you are exactly here because now you, that exactness, that is the certainty of your intersection of marginal cost and marginal revenue which determines the price is no longer exist because uh, as I said you know, this is price behavior is not uh, smoothly being followed by every firm when they cut as well as rise the price. So this, this, this creates some sort of rigidity in the demand uh, and that have a reflective effect in the total demand curve therefore there is a king inside but your marginal cost is somewhere uh, a, a range uh, where the price possibilities. So this is actually a moving away, right, from exact uh, fineness, uh, fineness or exact point where you uh, basically, you know, find your 
marginal cost which equates with the marginal revenue. So this is what is actually the kind of which is maybe looks very simple, but uh, when you logically, especially when when the time the when uh, time was actually not very favorable uh, to have a discussion of that kind, still actually many changes uh, very skeptically the economics fraternity takes up and get published. So the same problem is exists today also. Unlike you, you go along with their line of thinking, uh, it is difficult to get uh, papers published in that sense. So uh, this is uh, still prevails, but at that time also there are so much rigidity, but still he managed to bring out this issue in his paper, through his paper, in fact. So, what is the observation of King de Marker so important in that sense? Let's look into some of the aspects. So, prices are sticky if oligopolistic firm face King de Marker in that sense. So, this is the first observation. There is a stickiness of price in that sense. So, what is the stickiness? As I said, you know, when you cut the price, people will follow you. When you rise the price, nobody is going to follow in that sense. What? So, they, they stick their price. So the price stickiness is in fact a very very important observation and cost can change within certain limits and such firms will not change their price because they expect that none of their competitor will follow their price hikes but that will match their price cuts. So again this is actually uh, creates a kind of sensibility of uh, or sensitivity also the sensibility of uh, Mm, uh, sensitivity to the firms because the firm's behavior is also going to be uh, you know uh, uh, reflected through this because being a firm I myself knew that if suppose I change the price why I change if I am having a higher advantage uh, and uh, maybe because of the scale of production or, or uh, you know or other things which I have uh, uh, factored out earlier which helped me to in fact garner better profitability if I reduce the price that is what is my hope of reducing the price so I reduce the price immediately that is possible or to make at least some firms if that is the case then I'm not going to gain much of the market share in that sense or much of the expected market so what happens if then I'll move back to the old price then again I may not be actually able to reap because pre being a higher price uh, will drive the consumer out of uh, out from um, my product in that sense. So it is quite obvious that you know why should uh, you know I do that. So it is also makes a kind of stickiness of price behavior within why because of the rationality condition which normally every firm also try to you know yeah, um, yeah you know they internalize in that sense so uh, it is pretty logical to uh, go along with this particular observation what are the say what is the second one that the, the, the king to demand curve posits that prices in oligopoly will be less flexible in that and other market structure okay so this is another important observation the king demand curve poses that prices in oligopoly will be less flexible than in other market structure so this is also cru crucial this is also uh, a following uh, point from what we have or the price stickiness in that sense so so this is what about the, the, the king demand curve or all but uh, there are many uh, Economists, in fact, uh, critically looked at this particular observation. Uh, uh, first one is how did uh, the industry arrive at a prevailing price? This is a very important million dollar question, in fact. See, uh, while we talk about, uh, or when we talk about market uh, determination of the price, this question remains intact. Why? Because uh, See, we know that there is a price exists even in perfect competitive environment. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> even in the perfect competitive environment, the product is being uh, put for sale or in the market. But how the price being determined before production or after production? So there are so many questions which we need to really ask while we talk about 
uh, price uh, pricing or price behavior so normally uh, it is quite interesting that you know when you talk about perfect competition which we had already discussed and some of the uh, apprehensions have already been discussed uh, that is when we talk about uh, perfect competition um, it is uh, a priori the price exists a priori or the price exists posterior of the commodity being marketed in that sense this is a very important uh, point just like that there is a question of course the critic uh, post taking so this one how does how did the industry arrive at a prevailing price now suppose if you have this is the same logical issue that is if you have already a price exists how can one bring down that price because the price has been set a priori in the perfect competitive environment which is minimum price nobody can actually still we assume in textbooks and talks or try to make uh, 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 students uh, clear that you know if they reduce the price then they will lose all the market sorry they will gain all the market but they will be out from the market immediately okay why these are actually the kind of situations which you see in the textbooks i think and we will be a little bit cautious about textbooks you know uh, i'm not against textbooks but uh, textbooks are teachings of teachers but there are possibility possible you know misconceptions also uh, but anyway this is not therefore what i feel is that you know this observation how did industry arrive at a prevailing price now that depends it depends i'll come to that in a while so this empirical this critical question uh in my mind theoretically that possibility exists uh, but uh, the other thing is empirical issue that we have to bring out whether the price i mean most of the time the price is uh, you know what is their cost and an average price or something like that i from pop up you know there are many economists talked about pump prime price uh, then you there are economists talked about average pricing not marginal cost at all i mean it is difficult to find a marginal cost price because suppose if you know that the marginal cost is falling do you ever experience uh, uh, any every subsequent unit of output with a falling price i don't think if that is the case then people will wait for the nth commodity come out because logically that is possible because they have to bring out but at the same time they will not have an nth commodity production on the contrary from the business unit why because they won't produce more they will keep it okay so there are so many logical uh, interactive questions which emanates from the sort of uh understanding so empirical evidence points out that a number of oligopolies whose behavior cannot be explained by king to the monger of course uh, even a number of empirical evidence tells the other way around no, nothing to do with the perfect competition or the other kind of market situation etc all right so the results are mixed in that sense. so you cannot simply say that this is this is this doesn't exist at all so being a theoretical purpose or to understand it in a very theoretical perspective the possibilities logically exist and the possibility if logically exists means there is a chance okay and of course in empirical literature there are supporting literature that talks about this as well as opposing literature which talks about so we cannot simply say that the doesn't exist because there are evidence and there are no evidence in that sense so uh, i'll keep it as a discussion every time we can have an empirical observation and uh, come out with whether that particular set of firms do have or do follow a sort of uh, king to demand curve or not that's that is a study any anybody can basically uh perform because it never says that uh, what the earlier firm or earlier studies had found is the only relevant one and this is not absolutely not because your um, the firms changes your uh, uh,
basically uh, your unit of analysis changes etc so then that itself brings out certain novel understanding okay so uh, we cannot simply you know rule out the possibility that is the only point I, right now i would like to make and uh, now uh, if that is the case then there are many instances in which we can talk about formal price leadership models and uh, other things which uh, are, which is in fact followed from uh, the sort of uh, oligopolistic market situation that so the model is one of uh, one example of a group of uh, models that fall into strategy called price leadership theory such model provide one explanation of the level of uh, prevailing price in the community market model this next model provides an independent theory of oligopolistic behavior that applies to certain uh, market in that sense which is essential to understand the the assumptions or the key assumptions of this particular uh, understanding to basically substantiate the views of king to demand for the following that is one form in industry called the dominant firm determines the price and all other firms take this price as a given so this is what is called the dominant price dominant firms price behavior so the dominant firm sets the price that maximizes its profit and all other firms take this price as a given price. They don't in fact cut their price. No. So all other firms are seen as price takers in that sense and they will equate price with their respective marginal cost in that sense. Of course, this is also equally uh, observable in many industry or many firm in the real world. Okay, so as I said in the beginning, as the critic pointed out, it's actually non observable, but I don't think that it's non observable. There are many studies which, in fact, talks or try to validate that there is a possibility of existing in software uh, demand code. Okay, and the validity of the theorem uh, may be empirically proved. I'm not saying that this is the only theory which talks about all these things. So, this is one of the theories which is, in fact, uh, makes sense uh, to me in that sense. So the equilibrium price and quantity in, in that context is very relevant. That is the first row the market D and S curve in absence of the price leader. Uh, next to this graph, draw the demand curve of the price leader as the difference between demand and supply. As we said, the quantity demanded minus the quantity supply at each price at the marginal revenue and marginal cost curve, the presence of the price leader leads to a low market price in that sense. So this is what is actually the kind of understanding. So there is one dominant firm and a number of fringe firms. All right. So the horizontal sum of the marginal cost curve of the fringe firm uh, is the supply curve in that sense. So what P1, the fringe firm supply the entire market the dominant firm drives its demand curve by computing uh, the difference between market demand that is D and market cost function at each price below P1. Okay, if you carefully look into this aspect, you will see that. And uh, it then uh, produces quantity demand that is the final quantity which is requires and charges a PTN price and PTN becomes the price that is the fringe firm take. They equate price and marginal cost and produce quantity, you know, the firm's quantity in A. All right. So this is what is actually the point which being given. Uh, and then and the, the, this is what is actually uh, given the part A of this graph and they remain a reminder of the output is produced by the dominant firm in that sense. So there is a price, the dominant firm's price is always less, but there is a given price which is actually being set high. So there is a quantity okay of all the small firms as well as there is a quantity. So the price will be higher than this quantity, but it's been supplied in that sense. So So this is what is actually uh, the price leadership model drive you see in that sense. Okay. Now again in the oligopoly you have another set of uh, possibility this price leadership model and of course you have a cartel theory 
that is as we have already mentioned cartel theory but it is very essential to uh, touch upon cartel theory in the old sense in cartel several firms collude in an attempt to monopolize the market and uh, the incentive to collude price conception of course price competition may result in lower profit uh, for all firms if firms cooperate they may earn high profit in that sense and of course in the optimal cartel behavior the cartel uh, uh, behave just as monopolist would restrict output and raising price okay so this is what uh, we normally see everywhere so in that sense the equation of marginal cost is determining the marginal revenue kind of uh, understanding is nowhere exist all right so in the real world market situation uh, this is the rule of the game and cartel often fails if they don't actually you know follow uh, this principle that is if you have a higher price and your cost that means if anybody try to cut the price in that sense so then the whole cartel will uh, blow that is this particular firm is maybe can be called as a whistle blower in that sense so uh, there are possibilities of, uh, of not only possibility there are of course uh, advantage uh, of having this particular uh, cartel you know you make yourself in cartel a situation so the benefit of being members of a cartel is the following like we assume that the industry is uh, in long run equilibrium produce q1 so okay and changing p1 there are no profit okay a, redu a reduction in output to qc through the formation of a cartel raises price to pc and to bring profit cpc and ab now telling all this long run story is because in the long run we are all nice and good people everybody knows everyone and therefore no profit of them that no no uh, that long run never exists this as uh, you know the games rightly point in the long run we all die but of course i've been mean, putting aside all that fact suppose long run is nice but there is still a short run where you have all profit and you change a higher price and every transaction takes place in the short run in that sense so it's quite obvious that profitability and getting yourself in cartel and getting yourself in uh, uh, price leadership model or you know uh, being you being observed in a uh, cartel, uh, cartel or uh, in a king to demand framework is all possible in the short run at least so in the long run i don't know but uh, in the long run again uh, you say that the uh, profitability will fall never i mean profitability of what falls i don't know no firms uh, they may be existing because they have, because they long they uh, no longer match with their cost and then they exist. that is only for one firm but not for the industry per se no industry in that sense actually satiates their profitability okay they invent new and newer mechanism and become new incarnation of this thing and their profitability keep increasing in that sense okay uh, so it's very very important to uh, know that in the short run there is a high profitability and in the long run there is also so long run may be a, a, a heavenly or what you call the the ideal situation or perfect competitive situation but that doesn't exist okay uh, in that sense of course for an analytical category you can say that okay if that is the case then this much of profitability you can earn in the oligopolistic framework or in the monopolistic framework you can have the monopolistic uh, uh, framework you can have this much of profit and in monopoly pure monopoly you can have this much of profit so it is always trying to give you the quantum or the rate at which your profitability is being set so this is also crucial in that sense so problem with the cartels high profit with a will provide an incentive for firm from outside uh, the industry to join the industry but still it is a cartel even if many firms comes and they have to follow cartel 
cartel rules in that sense you know cartel is a very powerful system which is in fact operates or almost all the industries forms uh, these days cartels especially big industries international industries etc follows cartel Oh, you have of course oil cartel, you have a diamond cartel, you have gold cartel, you have all kinds of arms cartel, you have many kinds, you have drug cartels, you know, all international output is being, uh, you know, formed in cartels, you have steel cartels, you have now what not, mobile phone cartels, you know, all parts, etc. So the international market is now become more and more uh, sort of a, a monopoly or what do you call the oligopoly in that sense having with with high concentration in that sense whatsoever so high profit will provide an incentive of course many firm will come but naturally uh, i mean if their profitability falls then they get at uh, say they diversify and they will get again find their own solution in that sense but otherwise it's also possible of course what i am trying to make a point is that if you have a higher profitability, then naturally you invite many other firms inside or many firms inside of this industry, which is possible. This is perfectly fine with the oligopoly behavior, as we said, you know, there is an entry, uh, but it is not free entry, okay, but there is a possibility of entry. So it's fine. So after the cartel agreement is made, cartel members have an incentive to cheat on the agreement. Quite possible. And if a firm cheats on a cartel agreement and other firms do not, then the cheating firm can increase its profit. Or of course, uh, if all firms cheat, the cartel members are back where they started at. No cartel agreement and the original price. So these are possible, tough to form. High profit uh, may attract a new entrants. New entrants will increase the industry supply. The cartel will be forced to cut production or accept a lower price. And indeed, we know that this uh, cartel and all is illegal. In fact, this is anti-competitive, basically. Because in the United States, you have uh, a Sherman Act, a Clayton Act, and all this is anti-competitive. Act in India, you have uh, their MRTP Act, Monopoly Restricted Trade Practice Act, and uh, other acts. And now you have simultaneously uh, acts like uh, patenting, which is actually monopoly giving. Oh, there, there, there are other instances, for example, 2002, you have a competitive act. Um, now, these are actually uh, try to improve competition in the name of improving competition what you are trying to do you are trying to give uh, actually merging you are trying to make uh, firms internationally collude i mean in the name of uh, competition what normally happens is actually kind of concentration and if you do have concentration in that sense obviously you know monopoly exists and monopoly or at least oligopoly and concentration exist or it will uh, take place and uh, it is not your competitiveness per se increases your profitability because if you have higher competitiveness your profitability will be falling this is actually uh, antithetic to the market logic in fact uh, i don't uh, many times get this idea that you know if you're more competitive means uh, are you really uh, meaning that you are more, more monopoly or more concentrated uh, or you are actually you know your market condition is basically vulnerable to a different uh, competing firm for the market if you have different competing firms then the margin of profitability would be minimum why because you want to increase your commodity sales you want to increase you want to capture the market so you reduce the price in only you can actually capture the market again if you reduce the market the other firm also look into that aspect and they'll also reduce the market which we have already seen in the king demand firm but if you increase the price on the contrary nobody is going to increase the price then you will lose your market and they will gain their market in that sense so it is actually a uh, 
a very very tricky thing to understand so uh, i will leave that for a different discussion so benefit of cheating in a cartel agreement is actually the following which of course everybody knows you will get a um, high profit in that sense so you, maybe perhaps you if it is a cartel then you have to pay a price i don't know what is in fact uh, the price which the firm has to pay the situation for a representative firm of a cartel in long run competitive equilibrium in produce q1 other than the long run you have a q1 thing which is actually your yellow d which is equal to marginal cost of course uh, theoretically in the long run everything becomes you know perfect competition so perfect competitive situation that is no profitability where your p is actually you know p1 right which is mc equals p is equal to d which is ideal in fact uh, but that is not the case then comes perfect competition which will give you the different rate of profitability as i said in the earlier uh, lectures also so as a consequence of the cartel agreement it reduces output to q0 and changes vc its profits are the uh, are the pc uh, cpc ab cpc ab is actually being given all right uh that small portion now uh if it cheats on cartel agreement and other do not then the firm will increase output to q c all right uh and the real profit of fb and bc so this is again uh interesting but uh, there is a price for it in that sense okay so this is quite clear and uh, i think uh, we can look into uh, the problem with a prisoner's dilemma perspective in that sense which is going to be uh, the end of the lecture so let us look into the cartel and prisoner's dilemma the cartels will cheat on cartel agreements and uh, gain and uh, gain not again sorry again uh, again be in competition the very situation they want to avoid the only way out of prisoners dilemma for the cartel is to have some entity actually enforce the cartel agreement so there is always a cartel and that cartel is being regulated so normally every cartel is having a sort of a regulative framework they have uh, their own regulations like an informal very powerful regulation and you know, oil cartel Mm, gold card diamond card they may be having their own rule of game so mm, firm a's choice and firm b's choice is hold to agreement hold to agreement then they will be gain, earning a profit with the cheat they also lose it so you have actually kind of a different situation in that sense now there are other possibilities of a uh, mm, limit price thing especially uh the the thing i will be discussing in the with the next one limit pricing onwards let me uh, come to uh, discuss the king uh, the oligopolistic market uh, structure in a very different uh, way so uh, let me stop here because it is uh, it is a big lengthy lecture in that sense thank you for watching uh, thank you